Hi, I'm Susan Freeman. Welcome back to our Property Sheep podcast series brought to you by Mishkonda Rea in association with the London Real Estate Forum, where I get to interview the key influencers in the world of real estate and the built environment. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Fiona Fletcher-Smith. Fiona is Group Chief Executive of L&Q, one of the UK's leading housing charities with roots leading back nearly 60 years to the new wave of housing associations created in the 1960s, born out of a growing social consciousness around housing and homelessness. Fiona joined L&Q as Development Director in 2018 and became CEO earlier this year. In her time at L&Q, Fiona has spearheaded their £5.1 billion development programme, led their expansion into the Midlands and North West, and delivered change programmes to improve both the efficiency and diversity of their development and sales function. Prior to joining l q Fiona was the Executive Director for Development, Enterprise and Environment at the GLA. As part of the senior management team, she was responsible for overseeing the delivery and implement- implementation of key strategies such as the London Plan, the Economic Development Strategy, Transport, Environment and Climate Change, and in overseeing the operation of the Mayor's powers in relation to significant planning applications in the capital. So now we're going to hear from Fiona Fletcher-Smith on dealing with the challenges and opportunities for one of the UK's largest housing associations. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Where where are you speaking to me from? It looks like it looks like home. It is still home, I'm afraid. Uh, what are we in now? This must be month fourteen. I know, and um, it must have been particularly difficult for you because it's a pretty tall order to start a new role as CEO of a multi-million pound housing association um, in the throes of lockdown. So, how how in practical terms did you manage? Well, Susan, I think I was fairly lucky because being the internal candidate, I already knew the executive team really well because I was part of that team. And um, I also knew the, the, the staff group very well. It's desperately frustrating. My, my natural instinct is to get out, to meet people, to walk around our estates and our properties and, and just see the, how things are going. Um, But I've done my best. I think as L&Q, we hit the ground running in terms of how we communicated with staff starting last March. So we've been doing fortnightly live broadcasts to all staff. We have been doing online team meetings and really keeping the communication going, keep talking to staff. So, yeah, if I stop and think about it, it it is very odd to take over this huge role from uh, my dining room. But um, because I've been there for almost three years now already, uh, it it was easier than it would have been for someone coming in brand new to the organisation. I can say, yeah, I think it'd be very, very difficult for somebody, uh, you know, coming in and not really knowing the the personalities. And... So you, you initially joined L&Q in 2018 as, as development director. Um, what, what made you make the move from, from the GLA? Because you, I mean, you've been there for, I think, over 10, over 10 years. What, what prompted it? It was really interesting. I, I, I had to make a, a decision at that stage. The post of chief officer at the GLA was vacant. And I had to really decide whether that would be my next move. And what interested me was to move from the theoretical. And that's what you do a lot of in in City Hall. You create strategy and policy. And City Hall itself doesn't have a lot of money. So you're you're using influence and persuasion to, and whatever policy levers you have, to make things happen. What interested me about L&Q, well, there were a number of things, but but one of the big things was about rolling up my sleeves and actually building some homes for Londoners, rather than simply looking at the planning policy, looking at land use, looking at housing policy and economic development. Um, and this was a job that was far more real to me. So, so that was interesting. But also, I don't know if you know, but when I was an undergraduate, I used to temp in during my summer breaks with Ellen Q, uh, way, way, way back in the mists of time. And I had fallen in love with it as an organization and always watched it from a distance. 
uh, never thinking I would actually go back and work there. So when I was approached to apply for the development director's job, it just seemed, it seemed to be fate <laughs> as much as anything else. <laughs> No, that doesn't. I didn't. I didn't know that at all. But that, um, you know, that that is great because sometimes, you know, things are things are meant to happen. Yes, yes. Um, and I no, I didn't know because I I know that um, we effectively spent twenty five years working in local yeah. and regional uh, government. So you know, you you've been through a number of the London local authorities. Um, so I think Westminster, Lambeth, Hammersmith and Fulham and, and Hackney before you went to the GLA. So I just I, I wondered if there was anything that had really surprised you um, from being on the developer side of the fence, having spent you know, so long looking at developers from the uh, local authority point of view. Yeah. I think what surprised me most, Susan, was the absolute ignorance about how the local politics of an area works. Uh, what the processes are, um, how you actually engage with the public sector. Uh, it still felt, when I joined, it felt very heavy handed from the developer point of view. Um, it seemed to ride roughshod over local policies and believe that, that the developer knows best. And as a housing association, certainly, that that shouldn't be the case. We should be seeking all the time to work with the grain of an area. And the grain of an area is, is expressed in local policies. The other thing that always amazed me was a, a dismissal of democracy. And, you know, I've been at various dinners. I think you and I have probably been at various dinners together where, where we will hear developers say, oh, the planning system would be fantastic. We just take those politicians out of it. But what those politicians do is stand for election every four years. They stand up in front of the people who live in the area uh, and they represent their views and, and we have to listen because the, the reason some big development gets such a bad name and, and nimbyism increases no matter what you try and do is if you ride roughshod over local desires, local needs. Now that, that said, it's also about pushing the boundaries of thinking through local policies and local plans, um, but, but once they've expressed a view, we really should work with that grain. So, so the, the level of ignorance amazed me and I'm still doing a lot of work about uh, with, with our staff, getting them to understand the importance of local democracy and the importance of even the backbench councillor because you know they've done something I would never be brave enough to do. They've gone out, knocked on doors and said, hey, vote for me, it's a brave move. You're right. And, um, you know, you mentioned sitting around various, um, you know, tables, you know, debating some of these things. And one of the things I've been particularly struck by is hearing from local, um, you know, leaders and, and councillors about, you know, what happens when they, they put their head above the parapet to represent the community. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really oh. difficult. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we there's obviously a lot to be done in terms of building homes and you know making up the the, the deficit in in housing numbers, and we know that that requires collaboration between the private sector and the public sector. Um, I mean, do you see that sort of any differently now? Obviously, you know, you've made the point that developers need to understand, you know, the community and and the way local authorities uh, work, but. Um, you know, is there anything more that developers could could do to you know, create more trust between themselves and the local authority? Yeah, well, the, the, the first thing is the obvious thing, which is, is about listening and actively listening, uh, not coming in with a fully baked idea to see a local leader. Uh, you, you have to allow them to influence, to discuss, to explain their areas and their local priorities to you. Um, you've got to leave your arrogance at the at the door uh, and actually this view that the private sector have that politicians local politicians don't understand the need to make a profit is rubbish they absolutely do and they absolutely appreciate that that's how that's how the society that's how society and capitalism works it's 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 how it goes. So, so do not be afraid of, of talking about the viability of a scheme and what, what is affecting the viability of a scheme. Honesty, as much as you can possibly be, be transparent. Um, and yeah, listen, listen, listen. And listen hard enough, frankly, to change your mind if you need to, because uh, that's okay too. 
Um, it's also important not to disappear back into a black box to come out with yet another proposal. Actually make sure that local leaders are part of your thinking process and how you're evolving your ideas and your thoughts. It's, it's hard work, uh, but it's really, really rewarding. The other side of it is you mentioned the word trust, like trust in the post Grenfell world for uh, major house builders, for example, is, is in short supply. Uh, we have not, as, a, as an industry, covered ourselves in glory, have we, uh, in terms of the quality and safety of homes we're providing. We have got to get that right. We have got to put right what we did wrong in the first place, whether it's on workmanship, uh, whatever it is, we've got to put it right. That is absolutely essential. And we have to really, really embrace Dame Hackett's recommendations on the golden thread and on how we work as an industry. This is our chance to rebuild that trust and to get it right. And again, that's not that's not simple. Um, and I do wish some of my colleagues in the industry would stop putting a lot of energy into wriggling out of this and just get on with it. Yes, and I think it is it's it's going to mean, um, you know, whichever way you look at it, the money um, that's needed to, you know, deal with the remediation is not going to go into um, building building new homes and um, I think you've said that um, you're going to be moving back from the ambition of delivering 100,000 new homes over over 10 uh, years so um, how much money I mean how much time energy and money is is going to go into you know dealing with the cladding uh, issue because you I mean you've got a large portfolio there must be you know just hundreds of, of buildings that need to be dealt with we have uh, we've dealt with the most serious of the problems already and we also understand the the extent of the risk for us and, and we've put mitigation measures in place whether that's uh, waking watch whether that is sprinkler and alarm systems so so we've dealt with the most urgent but if you look across a stock of 110,000 homes uh probably about 200 buildings over 18 meters yes we have we have a lot more to do so we will be setting aside um, an amount of money probably in the region of um, 250 million over the next five years to deal with the over 18 meter buildings um, and we're waiting for government guidance on what they want to do below that height um, but we will be we, we will be working our way through this on a risk based approach, um, making sure that, that we um, deal with all of the fire risk issues that are emerging, whether that is wooden cladding, wooden, wooden covered balconies, whatever it is, we, we will come around and, and sort it out. Um, but that means, as, as you, you picked up on, that the money that we would have had <clears throat> to put into development is simply not there. We are making no excuse for the fact we are prioritizing the safety of our existing residents and their homes and investment in our, our existing stock. Uh, so that means that we'll go from an ambition of 100,000 over a decade, which was equivalent to 10,000 homes per year, to building in the region of about 3,000 homes per year, which for any developer or any housing association is still a fairly chunky development program. Um, but we are prioritising the people who live in our homes first. And will you get um, government assistance in the form of, of grants? Um, how, how much of it will be from the government? And because, you know, as you say, you're putting £250 million in. Um, do, you get, do you get help with that? Well, we have, along with um, probably everyone else who's got a tall building, put in applications for the Building Safety Fund, and we are hopeful. But, but we're not, not relying, relying on that. We're not waiting for it. We, we are just getting on with works. We can't, we, we can't assume that we're going to get a um, grant from, from that source. I mean, the government, has, the government is, is doing its best, and, and setting aside more money for this is, is really, really welcome. Um, no, none of us got into this intentionally. Um, the people I worry about are our leaseholders who potentially face very large bills. And we're absolutely doing what we can to minimize any bills that we have to pass on. Uh, so the government's building safety fund is really helpful in that regard. And alongside this, um, 
there's also the question of um, you know sustainability and and retrofitting existing existing housing stock to combat uh, climate change. I mean, will you be going ahead with that at the same time, or does that program get set set back because you're dealing with the cladding issues? Well, it, it's a very interesting question on Earth Day. I, I do feel the government's slightly dodging the question about what what they're going to say about residential property. Um, they, they talk a lot about electric cars, which is wonderful, well done, um, but actually one of the biggest emitters of, of uh, carbon in, is, is our residential stock and what are we going to do about it? If you own and manage 110,000 homes, this is a big issue. I think it's very easy to break into the new development side and get it right from day one. Going back to retrofit buildings, really, really difficult. But what we are doing is uh, two things. We are looking at the new future home standard that will come out eventually from the white paper. And we are looking at our sustainability strategy and trying to bring forward as much work as we can. Later this month, and there's not much of it left, later this month, we will publish our um, ESG framework which will contain a lot more information about our plans on environmental sustainability. But the ideal for me is you bring those two things together, the future home standard and environmental sustainability. We shouldn't be putting scaffolding up in a building to do things twice. We should, we should be, once we're up there, we, we should be doing both of the decent homes and um, environmental sustainability together. But we do need the government to, to, to actually step up and tell us what, where they're going to pitch this. Because until they do, what I'm, what I'm worried about is the, if, if you use the example of the electric car issue, they, they made a very clear statement about petrol engines, diesel engines, we know where it's going. Therefore, the car industry has adapted its entire R&D and production lines to produce electric cars. Even in my own home, I, my gas boiler is coming to the end of its life. I don't know what to do next. I don't know what the technology is. So if the government comes out with a very clear statement, but this is what we expect, the entire industry associated with heating and ventilation will then turn all its R&D efforts into producing what is going to sell. So we just, there's, that, that lack of clarity is, is damaging us all. Yeah, and um, knowing that real estate um, is responsible for you know, some 40% of global carbon emissions. Um, I think, you know, uh, I, I was actually quite surprised when I was looking at aviation because aviation gets a bad press, you know, because of, you know, yeah. carbon. that is like just over 2%. So the, the property sector really, I mean, you're right, we need certainty, you know, what, what do you do? Because you can deal with new builds and, um, you know, use uh, sustainable, um, you know materials and 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 do that, but most of our housing, and in fact, our you know commercial stock is 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 older. So, um, and it's it's really interesting as well because I've, I've been trying to have conversations with officials about obsolescence of buildings and and what do we do next. So when decent homes was introduced by the Labour government way back in wherever it was. 2000, um, they recognised that some buildings were, some housing blocks were incapable of being made decent. So there was, they set aside estate regeneration money where if demolition was the only option, you were able to rebuild. Uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be on the table here. They, they understand the concept of obsolescence in buildings, but, but they don't understand what we need to do if somebody is actually living in an obsolete building. And then you've got the problem that, um, you know, demolition and, you know, then rebuild is also not terribly sustainable. So it, it raises all sorts of all sorts of um, questions. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at the um, at the LNQ website and, you know, one of the sort of clear messages is that everything, everything you do begins with social purpose yes. and um, do you think that the real estate sector is beginning to understand the need to provide, you know, social value and that it's not just, you know, the housing associations that need to be you know, thinking, thinking that that way? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, I do. I, I think the I think I genuinely believe in, in ESG and um, the 
the, the whole real estate industry is really getting their heads around it, as are our bankers and investors. And you know, I've done a round of meetings with banks and investors recently, and the questions I'm being asked about what are we doing on our ESG framework have been well informed, uh, probing, serious. Uh, so I think I think everybody gets it. Um, so I, I really have high hopes. Where it's great for a housing association is this is all we do. <laughs> it's all we've ever done. It's, 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 it's all about social purpose. The environmental sustainability is, is only one element of it. Our um, LNQ Foundation, for example, uh, this year has got over 300 people into jobs. And this is during a pandemic when a lot of uh, the sectors that many of our residents would work in have been closed down or, or on more or less permanent furlough. Uh, so we, we've been doing a lot of this work naturally for decades. So I'm, I'm just glad everyone else is joining the party. <laughs> no, I agree. And, and you, you now you hear developers talking, uh, you know, about happiness and, and, and social purpose and these things. And I, I think you're right talking about investors, because I think if the um, if the developers don't get it themselves, they are going to be sort of moved along by their investors. Um, and also uh, tenants coming along wanting to know that, um, you know, the, oh, wow. everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, our, our tenants at, at LNQ, we have a, a new resident services board and um, it's not often I come out of a meeting at half eight in the evening energized um, because, as you know, 25 years in the public sector, I've done lots of those Jackie Weaver type meetings, which are just like so soul destroying evenings. Um, but I had a meeting with our new residence board who were really quizzing me on environmental sustainability and how was I going to engage with them and they had lots of ideas and it was it was a general genuine feeling of co-production of the services we're going to deliver the investment we're going to do it's not about us doing it to them in a paternalistic way it is genuinely a, a, a frank level conversation with our residents it was brilliant absolutely brilliant and do you find actually having been forced into um, you know doing these meetings um, on Zoom and, and and Teams over the last year has that actually sort of helped get people involved that weren't necessarily involved before or will it be yeah absolutely because it, you know nobody likes the idea of having to go to a drafty church hall on a Tuesday night in November oh you know as a woman you often don't feel safe being out after dark um, you know it's, it's taken me a long time to realise why I don't feel safe but <laughs> I don't feel safe um, and it's cold and it's miserable and if you've got caring responsibilities or children you know what are you going to do so this has allowed so many more people to get engaged we had a resident conference about two months ago on a Saturday afternoon and normally you would just get sort of the older retired group who would be able to turn up physically this time we had about 350 residents of all sorts of types of residents engaged because all they had to do was dial in from their living room on a Saturday afternoon. Many of them had their kids playing behind them, you know, in the same way that we all do. And uh, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. But what I'd love, Susan, is a more mixed economy. <laughs> I'd love to be out a little bit, a little bit on Zoom. Yeah, we'll, we, and we will get there. I think I think we will get there, but I think there are certain benefits from um, you know doing these online online meetings. Um, so just sort of moving the conversation uh, slightly, um, you I think you you've been involved in developing um, sort of L and Q opportunities in the northwest outside outside of um, London. So I guess you're you are keen to support the government's um, leveling up um ambitions and you know to focus investment a little bit outside outside of london so i just wondered what you were seeing you know in 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 the northwest yeah well we we have fantastic partners in trafford housing trust uh the team up there are amazing sean anstey who is their chair is is absolutely brilliant um what we are seeing there is a lot of energy and a lot of um coherent public sector policy and we are seeing opportunities and it's 
it's not just about LNQ moving into the Northwest and displacing lots of other people. It is about recognizing with an organization of our size and the strength of our balance sheet, we can do big things in the Northwest in the same way that we are doing Barking Riverside, for example, we can go into post-industrial um, land in need of remediation and we can really work with the public sector and other housing associations and developers in the area to do something at scale. So we're very, very, very keen on something major in, in the Northwest. We have retained our commitment to build 20,000 homes over the next decade in the Northwest. Uh, we see that as a massive growth place for us. And it's interesting for us as well. The, the, um, being a, having been a London-centric organisation for so long, um, people always assume that, that housing need is, is only a London and South East problem. But it, it's all relative. So if you look at um, the difference between the average salary or wage in the North West and house prices, you can see some areas of the Northwest are deeply, deeply unaffordable. I mean, the borough of Trafford itself, the, the south of Trafford towards places like um, Timperley and Altrincham, actually incredibly expensive places to live and comparable to, to London boroughs. Um, so we also hope that we'll be able to create affordable housing in, in the Northwest, particularly shared ownership, which is um, it's still quite a new product in some parts of the Northwest, but really is being snapped up where we're building it. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's fantastic because, I mean, just looking at the housing crisis, we've been talking about this housing crisis for, you know, so many years and there comes a point where, you know, if, if things aren't happening very quickly, you know, can you still call it a crisis? But, you know, we seem to have been building you know, quite a lot of residential homes, but just not homes that um, that are actually affordable. Um, and it, interesting that um, the last year has seen quite a lot of people move out of London and city centres. And um, it will be interesting to see if they actually move back back again. But a lot of it is going to be affordability, you know, jobs, um, and 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 that sort of that sort of thing. Now, you you mentioned. Um, Barking Riverside, and um, which made me think of Darren Rodwell, the <laughs> wonderful leader of Barking, Barking and, and Dagenham, who is doing a wonderful job of um, sort of bringing investment into, into his area. And I, I think the last time you and I saw each other in real life was at um, the London Council's housing conference, which in fact, uh, Darren invited me, me to. And you were on um, the platform with... Um, the late Tony Pidgeley and um, it was I mean it, it was it was something that really struck stuck in my mind because he had brought along and had on the panel with him the chairman of um, the residents association I think at Woodbury Down and oh, Kidbrook yeah it was Kidbrook yeah uh, and um, I just thought well, this makes so much sense you know she's the customer yeah. we have so many of these um housing conferences where the developers talk, local authorities might talk, then you just don't hear from the customer. Yeah. And I was, I was so struck, um, you know, by the relationship he had with Tony and, you know, the sort of mutual admiration. And it just sort of seemed to be, you know, really good example of a, you know, developer listening and, and, and working with the people that live there. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, gosh, Tony, uh, I, I, I miss him. I, I used to have breakfast with him once a month and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm losing weight on the back of not having breakfast with Tony, <laughs> but I, I, I absolutely miss him. I first met Tony when I worked at Hammersmith and Fulham on the Imperial Wharf development. And it's been fascinating for me watching, I watched his and Barclay Holmes evolution. Uh, when I first met him, he was building affordable housing blocks at Imperial Wharf where they weren't allowed to have balconies uh, because Tony was very worried that they would do things like hang inappropriate flags or hang their washing out or throw beer cans off the balconies. It was a very, very odd view of who lives in affordable housing. Um, and then by the time he got to Woodbury Down and to Kidbrook, he had learnt an awful lot 
through working very closely with local authorities. So what he was proposing at Woodbury Down and at Kidbrook, where Ellen Q are, are buying some of those homes there from Barclays, um, was so different and so much more engaged with, with real people who live on the estates. And you know, that, that woman's personal journey from you know, living on the Kidbrook estate, uh, the, um, oh, what was it called, Ferrier estate, um, mm. having a home infested with red ants where she was worried about her children constantly. To, to here she is, she's, she's been empowered through this process. She has stepped up to chair a residence association where if somebody had said to her 20 years ago, this is where you'll be, she wouldn't have believed them. And there she was in front of an audience of, of grim, dull professionals like us, and um, yeah, really, really stopped us all in our tracks for exactly the, the reason you're saying. We, we, we all just, you know, we're in this little cocoon happily talking to, our, you know, talking to ourselves, really. And um, there she was reminding us why regeneration, building new homes and doing it properly is such an important thing. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I felt sorry for her because Tony hadn't told her he was going to put her up on stage. <laughs> so <I'm not> joking. <laughs> <laughs> but she was brilliant she did brilliantly oh well she was she was a natural and I, I I remember you know she was saying that um you know when they originally heard a developer you know was 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 yeah. coming in you know they were all um you know very negative about it and I don't know what Tony and Barclay you know did to win everybody round but it was um it was it, anyway, it was a really interesting um, you know, conference, and I think something we should do more more often if we can actually, you know, get the you know the customers to come yeah. along and 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 talk about it. Just just before this call, um, I was talking to our resident services board chair and group board member Faye Ann Simpson, who is absolutely amazing, and she has been going to a lot of these sort of events, um, talking to the professionals, the so-called professionals. Um, and she, she is really starting to make an impact on, on exactly that, describing her personal journey as a, as a resident of LNQ and, um, and what matters to her. Uh, she's really been challenging me and challenging my team on the words we use, the language we use, and how we can come across as just being very paternalistic and uh, doing to them in a sort of feudal landlord kind of way, rather than a, a modern housing association who wants to have a genuine co-production of a service model. Uh, she's brilliant, she's absolutely brilliant. So, so what sort of things mustn't you say? Well, it seems like we, we, keep, we keep referring to our homes. Um, you know, I, I still do it. Uh, we talk about investing in our homes. And, and she points out to me, it's not your home, it's that resident's home. You may own the physical building that they're living in, but it's their home. And what you're doing is enabling them to make a home that they love and they feel safe in and they can bring up family in. And um, yeah, it's little things like that. It's really, really interesting. So we, we had a seminar with some of our senior leaders this morning to talk about our use of language in, in that sense. Um, and just to remind ourselves that, that yeah, that we, we don't know all the answers and, and we shouldn't be talking down to people and yeah, brilliant, yeah. It's it's so easy to to get it wrong. I I know I, I was pulled up by Tom Bloxham in, in one of the interviews because I was talking about housing units and saying <laughs> yeah. units, units homes. Um, so, yeah. So um, you have you've talked um, you know in the past about the issues of um, being a woman in a male sector, also the issues of coming from uh, an immigrant immigrant background. So. Do you think um, do you think your career to date has been um, easier or more difficult by virtue of the fact that you are different? I, th I think in in the beginning it it was certainly more difficult, and I had some horrible um, situations, uh, particularly during the IRA bombing campaign that carried on. We, we forget this now, but it carried on well into the nineteen nineties. And that was incredibly difficult because being Irish was, you know, it marked you out as, as being different and people made assumptions about you, which were, you know, none of us should ever make assumptions about anybody, but it was really, really difficult to deal with. 
Um, being a woman in construction, it, it took me a long time to actually realize that it was better not to be, not to try and outlad the lads, you know, just to actually be yourself, to bring your whole self to work. And there was there was a wonderful woman, and you might remember her name, Susan, called Sunny Sunny. It was Sunny Crouch. Yeah. Yeah. Who worked where she works? Is she worked with Cyril Dennis? That's it. Yes. And she took me aside one day, and she said, um, "Listen, ditch the grey suits." Her name <laughs> no. Yeah. She's look 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 around this room. She said, "This is just a room of grey and blue suits. You know, wear yellow." You know, and I suddenly thought, well, that's yellow is my favorite color. I love yellow, I love orange, I love bright colors. And uh, why am I trying to hide the fact that I am a woman? Um, so yeah, the next time I met her, I was in a, a very long mustard coat. <laughs> and she was right, so it's hard enough to be a woman. So you walk in and people were automatically turning to you and go, oh, didn't know quite what to say to me, but at least, at least I wasn't, uh, I didn't have someone ask me to pour them the tea. Um, so yeah, being, being Irish and being a woman, it's, it has been an interesting journey, but it's, it's also, you, you can let it get you down, you can let it get in the way, or you can just go, well, to hell with this. I know I'm good, I know what I'm doing, I'm just gonna get on with it. Um, and, and also, as I say, not to outlad the lads. You know, I, when I, I went through a phase working in construction where effing and blinding and shouting at people seemed to be the way things were done. And uh, I felt very uncomfortable doing it, but yeah, I, I gave that up after a couple of weeks. <laughs> it was exhausting. Is it, you play, you're playing a stupid part and um, yeah, it's much, much easier just to be yourself. But it's, it, it's interesting now to be this senior and to, to look back on it and, and to, to give some, some advice on um, what I brought, which was a, a different type of diversity, uh, a cognitive diversity as much as anything else. Um, and it was always fun to watch, to watch British people try and place you um, because whatever we think about British society, class is still an issue and in Ireland, I don't know how we've managed it over the decades since we, we moved away from Britain, um, but we seem to have become very classless and it's, it's really quite hard to figure out because we have a very different education system and, and whatnot. It's very hard to, to place me. Um, so I was an oddity in all sorts of ways. <laughs> People do like to be able to, um, you know, place somebody and pigeonhole them and um, it's troubling for them. Yeah. When, they, when they can't um so your your advice to a young woman coming into you know, construction real estate now would be to be your, be yourself or be yourself yeah and and also um be curious and volunteer for things i got most of my big breaks in my career by volunteering to do random things that i knew nothing about um, I once volunteered to implement a, a new IT system for a housing association. I knew nothing about IT. Uh, I still know nothing about IT, but I know an awful lot about human nature on the back of that. You know, at Hackney, I did things like I, I managed the mortuaries. I, um, yeah, in, in, no matter what it was, I've even been a shop steward. I was a shop steward for Nalgo, which was the trade union before Unison. Uh, that was brilliant. It got me access to management. <laughs> so you got your face in front of the leaders of the organization on a regular basis they may not have liked what i was saying to them but at least i was in the room so yeah just say say yes to to some really interesting opportunities i think i've gone through my career doing that and i have i have got myself into some very difficult <laughs> situations and i'm sure you felt the same you're sitting there thinking, why on earth did i put myself forward for this yes um so no, even, that, that, even that you learn from us <laughs> you learn that well you know that doesn't work for me <laughs> I'm not going to do that again <laughs> no it's it's uh, it's absolutely true and um I know that so one of the things that you've been leading at uh, l &Q is um this sort of diversity and um, and inclusion program and uh, you've talked about cognitive diversity, and um, I thought it might be useful to talk about what, what cognitive diversity is. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting. So sometimes I'll sit in a meeting, um, might be in L&Q, might be anywhere else, and look around the room and I'll see women, I'll see black faces, brown faces, I will see a lot of difference. Then it strikes me, wow, they all went to public school. Wow, they all went to Oxford or Cambridge. So, wow, they all think the same way. Um, so it looks as if we have a diverse group of people making, therefore making really good decisions. For me, it is about people who've had really different experiences in their lives. They help us make very different decisions. So I have an amazing um, person who works for me in development who grew up on a council estate in inner London. And that person is absolutely fantastic when you want them to look at an estate regeneration program or the design of, of a block, they're able to point out to me, well, that's not going to work because you know what's going to happen behind that bin store. I say, well, I don't actually, I've, I've never lived on an estate. Well, this is going to happen. Um, and their ability to connect with residents on the estates is fantastic. And their ability to pull me up on decisions and say, you know, that, that's silly. That's, this, this might happen if you thought of that. But if we've all been to the same schools, it, it was, I don't want to be political about this, but it was my, my real beef with the coalition government of, of 2010 or whatever it was, was, you know, what, 90% of them had been to Eton. <laughs> Just, but they can't be, they cannot be right. You, you've got to have people who've maybe lived on benefits, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who grew up with uh, a single parent with addiction problems, who, you know, grew up in, in a different country with a different culture, who have a different religion, whatever it is. It isn't just about the colour of your skin, it's about your lived experience. Yeah, and I, I often feel that, um, you know, whilst, you know, we want gender uh, equality, just putting, you know, women who come from the same sort of backgrounds onto a board with men who come from the same, you know, same background, you just don't get that diversity of thinking um, that, um, that you need. And even if it's uncomfortable, you know, I know people feel more comfortable with, you know, people who come from the same background, feel uncomfortable, but it will make you, you know, it will make you think differently yeah. yeah the best decisions for me come from a room where you're feeling uncomfortable they they, they really do they absolutely do yes it sort of pushes you outside your, your yeah. comfort yeah. zone um and just in terms of um working working with other developers does does l q work in joint venture yeah. you know, with other other development companies and how how do you how do you choose the people that you want to work with we're, we're very picky at l &Q, but we have, at the moment, we have about seven joint venture partners who are all absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, they range from the big guys like Barrett's to small, really high quality people like um, Hill Group or Mount Anvil. Uh, we work with a tiny company in Erith called Anderson's. And um, yeah, they, it's, it's brilliant for us because it's not only about a joint venture and risk sharing, it's, it's about the, the transfer of knowledge both ways. So I think we have brought a lot of knowledge of how housing associations work and how you negotiate public sector funding arrangements for, for schemes. We've helped tremendously with that in the same way that my salespeople and my development people have spent a lot of time with people like Barrett's and, and Mount Anvil particularly on sales and marketing. Um, there's an amazing woman who works for, for Mount Anvil called Lisa Walker who runs her sales and marketing, who is just, she's on a different planet in terms of thinking about this. And my team have got so much from working with her. Um, so it's more than just the financial and the risk sharing. It is, it's, it's a real transfer of knowledge between both. I want to do more um, with those partners and with, with other partners. Uh, we have, as you know, came in at the beginning of this conversation, we have a bit of a constraint on new business at the moment while we work our way through fire remediation and stock investment, um, but really do want to talk to good partners about doing something interesting and innovative. And I imagine, you know, you're planning ahead over, you know, the next five years, the next 10 years. So um, uh, 
Yeah, these you're right. These relationships take time. It isn't just that somebody comes to see you on a Monday and by the following Friday you're you're, you're in some kind of an arrangement. With Barking Riverside will will be another decade. Um, Greenwich Peninsula is the guts of a decade. Uh, we have to recognise that that real estate is a long term business and. These partners that we have, you know, Barrett's we've been working with for a decade. Uh, yeah. So, you know, just because I have no money today doesn't mean that you don't start the conversation now. Yeah. Otherwise, there'll be nothing in the pipeline when you're ready to, <laughs> yeah. to go full throttle. Um, and I, I just wondered... With everything that we've seen over the last year, um, with people like working from home and now sort of rethinking how they want to live and, and, and work, is it, is it sort of making you reconsider how you design your, um, your, your buildings, your communities, or are you just going to sort of wait until things settle down a little bit to see how it pans out? Because at the moment we really don't know. I think the, the, the first thing that, that I'd say is I'm, I'm not convinced people are going to exit cities in, in the way that, that some commentators think. I think there will be some people who will go and not come back, but I think we usually have enough demand in cities for uh, that space to be filled. What we have been doing over the last few years anyway was trying to create flexible spaces in our homes for sale, uh, where we've created study space that can be used as a home gym or playroom and, and we've tried to give extra space as part of what we do. I think what is going to be interesting and we need to keep this conversation going with government is on the affordable housing side where you're, you're um, to minimize your costs really so that you can um, reach various viability tests with the public sector. You can't you aren't allowed to put in a spare room because if that person moving in is on benefits, for example, so, so everything is paired back. But what we've seen during this last year is trying to homeschool and work at home, for example, if you don't have a little bit of extra space, it has been a nightmare and it has set kids' educational attainment back, I would imagine. Uh, and we will see that in future generations. So I, it's more, I'm more worried about the public sector allowing a bit more space. What we are also, continuing to do, because this is very big for us, is look at access to open space and green space. We have been very vociferous in um, saying no to Section 106 deals that involve private playgrounds and private bits and segregated from the people in the affordable housing. That is not, that is not how cities work and that's not how cities should work. Um, but we have been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of talking to people like Faye Ann from our residence board about how green space can be designed and accessible and used. Um, so that's, I think that's gonna go higher up our agenda, definitely. And, and what about the idea of having some like co-working space or flexible working space, um, you know, side by side with some of your uh, residential space? Is that, is that something that you do? Yeah, we, we have a little bit of that. Um, we have, we're always required to provide commercial space um, because it's, it's a part of a tick box exercise of the planning process, really. Um, none of us have ever done it terribly successfully. I, I don't class the Tesco's Metro as activation of a ground floor, frankly. Um, I think there's a lot more scope for this. And if I, if I look at the work I did in City Hall around the Outer London Fund in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, when um, we, we pumped a lot of money into Outer London town centres to try and get them rejuvenated. Um, the pandemic has now done that in London. And I, I'm very interested to find out if it's done it in Birmingham, in Manchester, Bristol. Because my, my little part of South East London, we've had two coffee shops, a bakery, a butcher, all open during this period. And the coffee shops here have queues outside them now at lunchtime in the same way that you used to queue outside press in town. Um, so, so I think a little mixed economy of doing a little bit of work that isn't necessarily in your home, but is in your local urban centre, wherever that is, whether that's, you know, Leytonstone or, um, yeah, Altrincham, um, and then going to the office a couple of days a week. I, I think that that does push you at some of this redundant retail space potentially being repurposed. Now it's really, really difficult for planners to get their heads around that because they, they, 
they're necessarily sort of living slightly behind the times because they they really genuinely believe that there is a retail operator coming and you just have to wait and you've got to stick to your policy and somebody will take that unit that they're not going to they're simply not going to retail is retail has been changing for well over a decade now we saw that in the work i did with croydon on the westfield um the westfield shopping center we could see the writing on the wall long before westfield were taken over that things were going to change so if if um some of the planners you know don't get it and they're you know they're they're holding out for retail and you've also got the problem of you know lots of high streets the like fragmented ownership so you haven't got one major landlord that you know can have the vision and push things along how how are we going to um how are we going to rejuvenate some of these you know some of these areas because people now seem to be more willing to use their local you know high street and town center um, so it's going to it's going to need you know some vision, some policy, you know some somebody to sort of push it push it along, and it's not necessarily the local authority. Well, I don't know if it needs as much policy. I'm, you know, I, I get really frustrated when somebody suggests, oh, let's reform the planning system. <laughs> not again. Um, I actually I have more faith in local leadership than that because um, if if you think about places like Shoreditch and Hoxton. There was no policy by Hackney to make that happen. In fact, and I probably the former mayor of Hackney doesn't want me to say this, but there was actually a bit of a policy of standing back for a while. We, we kept an eye very closely on licensed premises because we, we didn't want saturation. You've got to have more than nightclubs and pubs. But everything else, you know, there's small shishi shops, there's, there's little artisan food shops, all of that happened organically because actually what the public sector did was bought out and, and actually not imposed too much of a planning policy on us. Um, and that really interested me. It's happened as well in Hackney Wick, where, you know, who would have thought Hackney Wick was going to be a really sort of interesting arts um, commune sort of area, with fabulous bars. Um, nobody would have thought that. And again, there was, there was a brilliant councillor in Hackney, Guy Nicholson, who had the vision at, at, at cabinet level, not leader level, to just say, no, do you know what? We're just gonna stand back, see what happens. You know, technically speaking, five years ago, 10 years ago when I was in Hackney, and, ooh, 15 years ago, um, we could have taken enforcement action against some of the, the uses. But do you know what? They were interesting, they were kooky, there was, you know, it was starting to attract other people to come there, to go there. The area started to feel safe because there was a lot more footfall um, and just because the public sector stood back a bit. And some leaders have that, that vision to, to, to gently steer and nudge the rudder rather than come in heavy handedly with a pile of policies. I'm, I'm going to watch Croydon very carefully to see what happens next there. It's an amazing town, um, you know, we keep saying it's 13 minutes from the centre of London, but it's just brilliant on its own. It's yes, yeah, so I'm really interested in what how when, when the council recover from this this latest crisis, um, what's going to happen there? Well, that's an interesting that's an interesting um, tip. So um, I have um, I just have a final final question for you, Fiona. Um, if you do have any spare time how do you how do you spend it i mean from what you're you know the way you're talking about everything that's going on i can't imagine there is much spare time but um yeah i am um, we we're in the midst of interviewing for my replacement as development director so as soon as that person's in post i, I hope i will have a bit more spare time well it's it's this pre-pandemic and post-pandemic really isn't there? um i have a 10 year old son um so any spare time i get it, it generally focuses around him um, I also, I'm a passionate walker, uh, what, it's been absolutely brilliant during lockdown because it's been so quiet. I've been walking miles around London and just heading, I, I live in Bromley and just heading out my front door and seeing where I end up. It has just been fascinating. Um, cooking and entertaining and I actually, I got to entertain last week with five friends in the back garden absolutely wonderful i missed it so much i'd almost forgotten what to do though <laughs> on the morning i was thinking oh my gosh wine food <gasps> 
usually you, you you'd spend a week sort of planning a menu you know you, oh, no it's kind of a rush around tesco's at the last minute i've got out of practice <laughs> I'm amazed that you had time. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, I hadn't thought about the fact you're doing two jobs at the moment. So, um... Room at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> the end is in sight. <laughs> okay, well, well, I hope, I hope um, you, you announce uh, a new development director shortly. And thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. A huge thank you to Fiona Fletcher-Smith for speaking so candidly about her role and the role of Ellen Q in providing housing with a purpose. So that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Please join us for the next Property She podcast interview, which is coming very soon. The Property She podcast is brought to you by Mishcon de Rea in association with the London Real Estate Forum and can be found at mishcon.com slash property she, along with all our interviews and programme notes. The podcasts are also available to subscribe to on your Apple podcast app and on Spotify and whatever podcast app you use. Do continue to subscribe and let us have your comments and feedback and most importantly, suggestions for future guests. And of course, you can continue to follow me on Twitter at Property She and on LinkedIn for regular commentary on all things real estate, prop tech and the built environment.